Isaiah tonight, beginning in chapter 5. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for your word. You're an amazing God. You're so merciful, Lord, and your mercies are far beyond what we even understand. Lord, we have tasted, we've experienced, but truly, God, we have yet to and never will fully plumb the depths of your mercies. They're higher than the heavens above. Thank you, God, for accepting us and receiving us as we are. And thank you, God, that you don't leave us that way, God, that you mold us and shape us and change us from the inside out. And as we were praising you and extolling you and lifting our hands up to you, God, in song, so now we also do in the study of your word, believing that every word is God-breathed, inspired, and is profitable for us. God, these portions of Scripture that are less traveled in our lives, I know, God, that there are treasures and riches for us. And so help us, God, to pursue you, to seek you, God, earnestly. And tonight that there would be treasures found in your word for our lives that would last us for a lifetime. God, mold and shape us into the image of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, I had mentioned this morning um, to you, I shared my personal opinion this morning, and normally when I do that, I, you know, just, uh, I lay the caveat out. Sometimes when I'm dealing with something and there's an emotional reaction, I share that with you, especially when it comes to, you know, the condition of our country, and sometimes how frustrating that can be. Um, and, you know, this morning I was talking about how it just is so evident that atheists and atheistic organizations have a very clear agenda to expunge God in every vestige of God from the public square in this country. From every founding document, from every uh, memorial that's been placed up in some uh, public institution, you know that there is a clear agenda every single week. There's another issue being raised by the ACLU or some other organization that is demanding the separation of church and state. Um, and, you know, it's, and the truth of the matter is this. If you do your homework and you study our history and you go to some of these places, uh, you know it would be a literal impossibility to expunge God from the history of this nation unless you change the history of this nation which is what they're trying to do. There are professors in secular universities uh, who have a very clear agenda. They're rewriting history books, uh, and there is an effort to brainwash people, a young generation that doesn't seem to know any better, uh, that, that God had no part in the founding of this country. Now, you say, why are you talking about this right now? Well, because I feel strongly about it, but also because today is the 200th anniversary of the penning of the Star Spangled Banner. I don't know if you know that, but Francis Scott Keyes, 200 years ago, uh, just after the Battle of Baltimore in Baltimore Harbor in the early 1800s, uh, he, if, if you've ever been there, it's an amazing place, and the fort is a, an amazing place to visit. But as uh, America was victorious against the English and their desire to retake America after they lost the first time, you would have thought they would have learned their lesson, but no, you know, they're the English, and so they tried it again, they, they lost again, and he penned the Star-Spangled Banner not too uh, shortly after that victory. Now, there are a bunch of stanzas, and uh, you know, we're very familiar with the ones that are sung before um, athletic competitions and things like that, but there are a lot of stanzas in the, in the Star Spangled Banner, and you know, this is just me, I can't help myself, but as I was reading through the Star Spangled Banner again, the last stanza really stuck out to me, especially with the repeated over and over every single week desire of atheistic organizations to expunge God from the public domain. Uh, the last stanza really stuck out to me, and I just wanted to share it with you um, just to rekindle that fire in your heart for God's place in this country. And this is how that last stanza goes. It says, Oh, thus be it ever, 
when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. I mean, it's pretty clear, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I love that. Love it. And listen, that is germane to our study. I, I do, obviously, as we look at the scriptures and we consider application, application layer number one is without a shout, without a shout, <laughs> without, without shouting out loud tonight, it is the nation of Israel. Um, but in addition to that, application layer number two is us, the church, believers in Jesus Christ. Application layer number three is any nation that has proclaimed God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be its God, which is where we used to be as a nation. And so when we consider this wayward nation, what, what we really haven't developed a lot, we did in Jeremiah, what we haven't developed a lot yet are the symptoms of a wayward nation, a wayward nation that used to proclaim God as its God, but has drifted from that proclamation and relationship. Um, and listen, we may not drill down on that a lot in Hosea, but I want you to keep it in mind, because the symptoms you see in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, are no different, I'm saying to you, no different than the symptoms we see in our own country today. And I would say to you that the resolution, the remedy, the fix is the same today as it was 2,600 years ago for the nation of Israel. So I want you to tuck that into the back of your mind and uh, just consider that while we all, of course, are praying for this country that we love so much. Verse 1 says this, Hear this, O priest, take heed, O house of Israel, give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment, because you've been a snare to mitzpah and set and a net spread on Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. Uh, now, we've developed it, you know, in great depth the spiritual condition of the northern kingdom. Remember, uh, the kingdom was united under Saul, under David, and under Solomon. And then as Solomon died, his son Rehoboam uh, took the reins. The kingdom was soon divided uh, because Rehoboam was not interested in the wisdom of the elders. He was interested in doing things his own way. And the consequence of that, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit tonight. The consequence of that was the division of the kingdom. There were ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Jeroboam became the ruler in the north. Remember, he knew he had a problem on his hand. He had to maintain the loyalty and the fidelity of the ten northern tribes. He couldn't do that while everyone was going to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. So what did he do? Remember what he did? Great, thanks. Now, this is a responsive time because I've said this a couple of times. So instead of me giving you the answer, and you're right on track Remember, he made two golden calves. He said, behold, Israel, the, the God that rescued you from Egypt. He set those strategically in two places in the northern kingdom. He created a counterfeit priesthood, not a Levitical priesthood. And he, uh, making his own religion, replaced worship in the northern kingdom that was typically done in the southern kingdom. He had uh, all sorts of religious holidays, holy days, high days. And so he cut that bond, that tie that existed between the ten northern tribes and worship that was happening in Jerusalem. And this is what God is dealing it with because the whole nation immediately was steeped in idolatry. God will use the term Ephraim um, as an umbrella term for the ten northern kingdoms, or the, excuse me, the ten northern tribes. And of course, you know, 
the judgment of God was righteous. He's talking about a snare that had been laid in Mitzpah, uh, a net spread on Tabor. If you go with uh, me to Israel, by the way, we're taking a trip November 2015. God willing, we'll be in Petra as well, so tuck that away and pray about it. Uh, Mitzpah is one of the mountains uh, on the ridge of Hermon, uh, which is a huge mountain, mountainous ridge, high elevation. Uh, Tabor is a very unique mountain. It looks uh, kind of like a domed mountain. You can pick it out very easily. It's in the Valley of Jezreel, just to the southeast of Nazareth and to the north of uh, where Gideon was victorious over the Midianites. And so these two places, and there's a lot of different perspectives on why God is kind of laying out these two particular places. Uh, some people say that these places became high places. And so what they would do is they would pick a high place in elevation, thinking that in higher elevation they were closer to God, and it was there that they would commit their idolatry, um, which, you know, all of the practices surrounding the foreign gods that they were worshiping were very immoral. And so God may be saying these places have become a snare for all of uh, the ten tribes. There are some who say that Mitzvah and Tabor were a place uh, where they would uh, do hawking, and that is you know, where they would have birds that were set, birds of prey, and they would capture other fowl in nets that were set as they would be utilizing these birds of prey. So God is saying in some sense uh, that the northern kingdom had become a snare, not just for itself, but also for the southern kingdom, for Judah as well. Notice in verse 4, the Bible says, they do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God. For the spirit of harlotry is in their midst, and they do not know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles them. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He's withdrawn himself from them. They've also dealt treacherously with the Lord. For they have begotten pagan children. Now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. Let me remind you. You know, Hosea is one of the strangest books in the Bible because God calls his prophet to do one of the strangest things. He calls this young man who's a prophet to go and to marry a girl who's in prostitution, a common street prostitute, to take her unto himself, to wed himself to her, to have children. Of course, you remember they had three children. God, knowing what would happen, this girl turns away from her husband. She goes back into prostitution, and she becomes desolate. And in her desolation, God calls Hosea to go and to buy her back. Not only did he wed her the first time, but he paid her wages as a prostitute, purchasing her for himself the second time, taking her in, loving her, redeeming her, and caring for her. And so, listen, when we read this book, don't approach it from just a sterile, um, you know, perspective where we're just going verse by verse. This is a love story. This is God saying to the nation of Israel, this is how much I love you. And these are the great lengths that I will go to to redeem you to myself. Listen, even in the midst of your harlotry, even in the midst of your idolatry, as ugly and as wicked as it may be, my heart will always burn with love for you. The nation of Israel was the apple of his eye. And so as we read the story, even as we're working through the consequences, the judgment on the northern ten tribes for their sin, remember the heart of God was always to draw his people back. We talked about that last week, how for us as children of God, he is our maker, uh, he has made us, he shaped us, created us in the matrix of the womb. Every single physical cell made by God, I mean, that's an amazing thing, but he's also redeemed us. He's purchased us. He's bought us. Not only does he have ownership because he's our maker, but he has bought us. Peter said, not with silver and gold according to the aimless traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So the Father has made us and he's bought us. He's redeemed us to himself. And that is the heart of 
this story. That's the heart of God for you and for me. So keep that in your mind as we're working through these verses. But this was the problem. As much as the prophets were speaking truth to the northern kingdom, the Bible says in verse 4 that they didn't direct their deeds toward turning to their God. In other words, listen, they continued in their harlotry. They were, though, convicted just enough that verse, verse 6 says they came with their flocks, they came with their herds to go and seek the Lord, but he, they would not find him because he had withdrawn himself from them. Look at, in other words, there was this sorrow, this sorrow that was not really leading to repentance. There was just enough conviction for them as they were caught in their sin to say, uh, yeah, that was wrong, but they were still going through religious motions. They would come and they would make their offering to God, but God knew that their repentance was not real. Now listen, how do we know when repentance is real? How do we know when repentance is real? There's a great definition in verse 4, and I want you to just... Define repentance for yourself. It's biblical like this. They do not direct their deeds towards turning to their God. That's repentance. Hey, you can be sorry all you want. And I'm not saying that sorrow isn't necessarily bad, but if sorrow is just emotional, if sorrow is just bummed because you got caught, if sorrow, you know what that's like, <laughs> busted, just flat out busted, and so there's this pain and anguish, and it's really not repentance. It's just like bummed. I'm bummed that I got busted. And so, you know, you can, you can bear a form of sorrow that's not necessarily repentance. There is a sorrow that does not lead to repentance. There is a sorrow that does lead to repentance. So you say, Pastor, how do you define repentance? And I just got to tell you guys, you know, as a pastor, and this applies for me first. Definition of repentance applies for me first. So when I say this, don't think I'm saying it in a judgmental sense. But as a pastor, you know, there are many times where people will come in the same situation over and over and over again. And maybe it's a marital issue. And maybe there's a particular struggle. And here, you know, for the fourth time or the fifth time or the sixth time, we're dealing with the same issue. And the guy or the girl looks at me and says, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. And I say, you know, uh, thank you for your sorrow, but what God is really looking for is for repentance. And they may say something back, well, I am repentant. And I say, let's just define repentance. Let's define it. Repentance means that we change our ways. It is acknowledging that we're agreeing with God on some specific moral issue, that God's perspective is right and our perspective is wrong. And we uh, enforce that change of mind in our lives by changing our behavior by God's strength. Let me tell you something. You can't uh, repent in a way that's productive unless you're trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin in your life. Because I can't overcome sin without the Holy Spirit, and you can't overcome sin either. And so, listen, when you look at the issue of repentance, what you need to factor into your equation is the variable of victory. Expect God, if you're truly repentant, to give you the victory over sin in your life. Because if you don't, and sin is chronic in your life, and you're just dealing with sin in a sorrowful way, this is what you'll begin to say, hey, you know what? It works for everybody else. I guess it doesn't work for me. I tried that, and I guess, you know, it just doesn't work. Inevitably, what happens is it becomes God's fault and not your own fault. And I see this so often, people blaming God for their own unwillingness. They come to me and they say something like, I can't. And I say, let's reword that to I won't. Because really the issue isn't I can't, the issue is I won't and then they get up and leave. No, I mean, you know, sometimes. So look, let's just be honest with God. And what God does not want in our lives is uh, religious offerings to cover our unwillingness to repent 
or our willingness to accommodate sin in our life. Verse 8 says, Blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at beth Aven. Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. I'll pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth and to the house of Judah like rottenness. God says, I'm going to eat you up. I'm going to eat you up. But this, look at this was the issue. Now, Israel's not the only one with the issue. Judah has an issue as well. Because as God was bringing judgment to the northern ten tribes, Judah, this was what Judah was thinking. Hey, you know what? Assyria's come in. They've wiped them out. What an opportunity for us. We got an opportunity for a little land grab here. And in their mind, instead of being broken, instead of mourning over the spiritual condition of their sister Israel, Instead of personally taking it to heart, this is heavy duty, instead of taking it to heart and thinking about what they could learn from what God was doing in the northern kingdom's life, they thought, hey, man, opportunity, this is great, we'll go get a little more land, we'll remove the boundaries. Now, God was not pleased with this, and he rebukes them for this, what can I get out of this attitude? And the issue was this, Judah uh, was like those who were removing a landmark. Now, I just want to remind you real quickly tonight that God had set up territorial landmarks. God had mapped out very clearly what each tribe's allotment geographically was. And there were uh, landmarks that were set up to make that distinction. This was what Judah was doing. Um, in their desire to get this land grab and to wipe out the landmarks, what Judah was implying was this, that God wasn't faithful to keep his promises to those particular tribes. They were saying something like, hey, they're done with, their time is over, let's go take what God had given to them. When they should have been saying this, God's promise to them is eternal, God's faithfulness is unchanging, God is going to bring them back into the land, so let's preserve that allotment for them because we know God will never fail on his promises. Now, let me say this. When we have a brother or sister who's struggling in the Lord and, and God is dealing with them, God is chastening them, maybe there's a ministry and they've got this amazing ministry and there's moral failure in their life, and God deals with them, and they're removed from ministry, our heart shouldn't be, hey, look, ministry's up for grabs. Check that out. I've got an opportunity. Our heart should be, Lord God, restore them. Restore them to that ministry. We know that your promises are yes and amen for that brother or for that sister. Our heart should be, God, teach me. Help me to learn. Help me to watch very carefully, God, and take to heart every single thing that you're doing in that brother or sister's life so that my life is guarded from walking down that same road. You know, when we do that, we affirm, and this is what I hope we want in other people's lives as well as our own, we are affirming the faithfulness and the consistency of God. He never lets us go. He never throws us away. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Aren't you guys happy about that? Aren't you glad about that tonight? Listen, how many second chances have you needed? <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh. <laughs> you, can you count that high? I guess that's my question tonight. If God's that faithful in our life, I pray that we um, have that heart of mercy and compassion for those around us. There are parameters, there's borders that God has set up. For the nation, they were territorial. For the nation, they were also moral, all right? There were uh, principles of ministry that leadership was supposed to walk by. Rehoboam, when he took over the kingdom, he abandoned that. He abandoned not just the territorial landmarks, he abandoned the moral landmarks that had been laid down by his forefathers. He wanted to be relevant, and so he grabbed all of these new young guys 
He got the old guy's opinion, then he got the young guy's opinion. He booted the old guys and he followed the young guys to his own demise. And the whole kingdom was then split in two. Now listen, today in the church, we have to be very careful not to commit that same error. I am all for a new wineskin, I am all for new wine, but not at the expense of ancient Christianity. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are boundaries, there are landmarks that have been established by God and His Word that have been maintained by men and women who have gone before us. And God help us to never, in the name of progressiveness or uh, to be relevant, God help us to never abandon those things that are biblical. Now, you might be thinking here tonight, Pastor, we don't do that. We would never do that. Let me tell you something. It is happening all around us in Christianity today. It's happening all over the place. There are moral landmarks that have been set up in the eternal word of God that are being abandoned wholesale in churches. I'm not just talking about in the secular world. I'm talking about from the pulpit. I'm talking about in denominations that once had um, a fire and a name uh, for God's work through their lives. Many brothers and sisters struggling today in these particular denominations as there's a battle over moral issues, as there are some who would say, hey, we need to be accepting, we need to be tolerant, we need to embrace everybody, and we need to accommodate everybody in whatever lifestyle they may be involved in. Now, let me tell you something. I want everybody to come to church. I want everybody to come to church from the uttermost to the guttermost. We want the whole city of Las Vegas here at church, but we are not going to compromise the message. Sin is sin. God has laid it out. It's very clear. You know, we can, we can communicate the message in love, but we don't have to be apologetic about it because it's not just our opinion. It's what God says, and you know God is best. Every single sin that God was convicting me of before I came to Jesus Christ I am so glad that he revealed to me how evil that was and how good his will is. There are issues of morality when it comes to the scriptures. There's a landmark that's been set, the inerrancy of the word of God, the inspiration of the word of God. And today, there are uh, young pastors and old pastors who are stepping away from these landmarks that have been set for us by our spiritual forefathers and declared clearly in the word of God, people are abandoning the inspiration of scripture. They'll say something like, well, you know what? It, it's really the principles that are inspired, not the words. The word of God's not inspired, but the theme or the principle is. You know how dangerous that is? I believe every word in the word has been ordained and placed by God. You know the... The rabbis taught that even the spaces were ordained, and I'm down with that. I, I like that. But, you know, it's for us um, important to maintain the belief that what we have in our hand is fully inspired by the Lord. I think about how the position on who Jesus is is radically changing in this culture in the sake, for the sake of being relevant, for the sake of connecting Jesus to the common person what people have done is they've um, reduced his divinity to only humanity. They'll emphasize his humanity so much. This is what I mean. They emphasize his humanity so much, they strip him of his deity and his holiness and his righteousness. And I've said this so often, I know, please just bear with me as I say it again. They make Jesus your homeboy. You know, where we got the t-shirt, hey, Jesus is my homeboy. When I see him in heaven, little chest bump. Give me a little dog. Hey, bro, what's up? You know that's not going to be the way it's going to roll. You're going to fall on your face when you see him in his holiness. And there's nothing wrong with that. He is our high priest. He has the ability to take us, sinful humanity, and connect us with the holy God because he is the God-man. Proverbs 22, 28 says this, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And I am at complete peace with that. We as a ministry will not remove those landmarks. And you can say, hey, you know what? You're so anachronistic and out of time. It doesn't matter to me because those things have succeeded over 2,000 years. Cultural trends have come and gone, but the word of 
God remains forever. Verse 13 says, When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Yareb, Yet he cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one will rescue them. I will return again to my place. Now watch this. Till they acknowledge their offense, then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So this, God is so cool. This is what he says. I'm going to deal with them. And you know what? There will be no escape. I love them so much that they won't be able to escape my chastening hand. They're going to go and look for help from all of these other places. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to shut every single door. And they're going to recognize that until they deal with me, it will never be right. Now, I love this about God. If you've ever been wayward for a moment in your relationship with God, you know what he does. He sends the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and, and let me tell you something. The hound of heaven has your scent. He will track you down, and he will close every single door. And when you or I are wayward in our walk, we are the most miserable people on the face of planet Earth. He will deal with us. God lovingly takes his thumb and presses, presses down on us. He doesn't crush us. He doesn't smash us. He's not trying to destroy us. He just, and get this picture in your mind. Here you are wiggling and you're trying to squirm your way out and God's like, nope. I mean, do you really think you're going to escape? This is why the prophet says, come let us reason with the Lord. Just give up. Just trust in God. God says, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to go back to my place, and I'm going to wait. Every door is going to be closed. You are going to be miserable until you finally come to your senses and acknowledge your offense. In other words, until you come to me and take responsibility for your actions. This is what God wants. This is step one in our hearts turning back to God, simply acknowledging to God what we already know and what he already knows, that we're broken, that we sin, that we are responsible for our actions, our thoughts, and our words. And you know, there's no healing in our life, there's no rightness in our life until we confess that to God and forsake it. The Bible says the person who does that will receive mercy. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the heart of God for you and for me just to simply own up. Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard for us to admit that we were... You can't even say it. You can't even, you can't even say it. You're in an argument with your wife, and you're like, I ain't saying I'm wrong. You know, she's wrong. She's always the one that's wrong. No, guess what, buddy? You're... <laughs> Can't even get the word out. Listen, what's at the root of that is pride. We are just so absolutely prideful. And it's so good to get the burden of that off of your heart. What a relief. For the nation to come to a place and just finally admit, God, you know what? We are responsible. We've sinned against you. And immediately that burden, that guilt, that shame, that weight that was pressing down on them was lifted. Do you want that weight gone? Do you want that burden lifted? I think of Pilgrim's Progress. And Christian, you remember the character was bearing this weight, was bearing this burden until he came to the cross. And when we come to the cross, this is what we do. We just ex simply acknowledge to God our responsibility for our own actions. And what does God do as we trust in Jesus Christ? He lifts that burden of guilt and shame from our lives. I want you to notice as well, he says, then they will seek my face. So there is an acknowledgement of culpability and then it's turning to God and seeking his face. Would you please notice here, it doesn't say, then they will seek my hand. It says, then they will seek my face. I think sometimes what happens in our life when we're sinning, 
God allows affliction and difficulty. He brings a storm into our life to chasten us and to wake us up. And sometimes what happens is we, in that moment, recognize that we're wrong, and we want the blessings from God's hand. And so sometimes there's a very shallow repentance in our life until the storm is gone, the blessings return, and then we go right back to that pattern of sin in our life. This is why God is very specific And he says, then they shall seek my face. And what's being expressed here is a heart of love towards God, that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. God, this is what that means, okay? This is what I mean when I say that. God, even if those blessings never come back, God, even if my life doesn't return to the way it was. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to love you with everything I have unconditionally, no strings attached. And that's what he says, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. The word earnest was used for someone who was scanning the horizon, somebody who was a guard, set on a guard tower that was looking with great intensity Uh, And so this is the picture that's being given here. The word earnest means with great seriousness. And so, in other words, they're so repentant of their sin, now their relationship with God becomes absolute priority in their lives. Chapter 6, verse 1, this is a short chapter. Come and let us return to the Lord. He is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. And so the prophet says this, just beseeching the people, listen, let's return to the Lord. Why are we letting these things in our life hold us back from our relationship with God? All of these lies that have ensnared us as a nation and as a people and have been ripping us off from the fulfillment of God's promises in our life, let's just take responsibility for our sin. Let's turn our hearts back to him because this is his promise. Even though he's torn and stricken to get our attention, he will heal us, he will bind us up. And not only that, After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. This is the picture. Look at this is the picture of redemption. This is the picture of the heart of God. People talk to me sometimes, you know, Pastor, I love God, but I've walked away. I've been in the world. I've been sinning. I've gone back to the things that, you know, I know God doesn't want for my life. And you know what? It's over. I might as well just give up. And I say to them, you know what? It's never over. As long as you have breath, there is always an opportunity for repentance. And the heart of God in your life right now is to heal you and is to bind up those wounds. And sometimes they say, you know what, there's no way. I'm too far gone. I want to say to you tonight, maybe there's one person in this room this evening, and you have uh, gone off into the world, you're knee-deep in sin, maybe sins that had ensnared you before you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Your life is laden with guilt and shame. You're here tonight. You're burdened. You're broken. You feel so bad because God has done so much for you. You almost feel bad that you're here. You failed him so much, and you're thinking, God, is there any possible way you could receive me back? God, is there any possible way you could forgive me of my sins? I want to say to you, Without a shadow of a doubt, the answer is yes. That God has brought you here tonight to bind up, to heal, to restore. This is the heart of the Father for you. His eyes have never left you. No matter where you've gone or what you've been involved in, the eyes of God have never never left you, and his heart has been for this moment where you will turn your life back over to him. And as you do, you know what he's going to do. He's going to embrace you. He's going to love you. Just like the prodigal son's father, he's going to put a signet on your hand. He's going to slay the calf and have a party. The Bible says when one sinner turns in repentance back to God, all of the angels in heaven rejoice. And so tonight, if that's you, I believe that's God's message for you. Now, it's interesting as the nation, they say two days he will revive us. 
On the third day, he will raise us up. This is a possibility, so just you know, keep this in mind tonight. The Bible says uh, that a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. All right? Now, if that's our equation, two days, if we're to take that literally, in other words, two days would equal how many years? Oh, you guys are good. Great education. Three days would equal, oh, you guys are on it, man. I'm so glad. So I want you just to think about this. For 2,000 years, for 2,000 years, the nation of Israel dispersed across the globe, uh, not living in their homeland, no worship in Jerusalem. For 2,000 years, that has been the story. If this equation holds true, all right, I'm just saying it's a possibility and maybe more than a possibility because what we're seeing is the rebirth of the nation. I say, I'm saying to you, I see this literally fulfilled before our very eyes. That this is prophetically speaking of the rebirth of the nation. 2,000 years of desolation, 2,000 years of being dispersed across the globe, those 2,000 years are being fulfilled. God is reviving the nation, and on the third day, he will raise us up. That third day, that third set of thousand years, the millennial reign is when God is going to exalt the nation of Israel. By the way, Ezekiel chapter 37 ties into this verse, the prophecy of the dry bones, where God takes these bones, breathes life into them, covers them with flesh again, all of that emblematic of the rebirth of the nation of Israel, time-wise, I believe, laid out here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. That means for you and for me that Jesus could come back at any moment. Looking forward to that. So they say, uh, let us know. That means to experience God. Let us pursue the knowledge of God. Uh, his going forth is established as the morning. The constancy of God is unchanging. And he will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. The reviving heart of God for you and for me. I say that this prayer is something that we ought to be praying this verse is something we should be praying for the church, that God would pour his latter and former rains out on us today. Verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. Therefore, I've hewn them by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth. Your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There's harlotry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. Now listen, I just... Uh, I want to close with the verses 4 to 6 tonight. God says to the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that their faithfulness is like a morning cloud uh, and they are like the early dew that goes away. So uh, it was just words. Everything, all of their commitments to God, all of their supposed faithfulness was like the morning cloud that burns away. You guys know how it is in San Diego when you've got June gloom and you're hanging out waiting for the sun to shine on the beach, and you know it's not going to be until noon, until that cloud is burned away by the sun. This is what he's saying to the nation of Israel and to Judah. You have all of these commitments of faithfulness, but the truth is it's here today and gone before even tomorrow comes. It's like the dew on the grass that burns away. I think this is a solid exhortation for you and for me that when we make a vow or a promise or when we're committing ourselves to the Lord, that our actions follow up our words, that our yes is truly yes and our no is no. And God says this, by the way, this is something that Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God is simply saying this, I'm not interested in your religiosity. I'm not interested in you just coming to temple and making a sacrifice or observing the Sabbath or keeping the high feasts while all of this sinfulness is being accommodated within, within your own heart. God says, what I would rather have 
then those sacrifices or those burnt offerings is mercy in your life and you experiencing me. Now listen, I, I shared this on Wednesday night. This is something that we have to be so careful of. We have a liturgy in this church. Every church has a liturgy, which simply means we have, a, we have an order of service. We have five songs that we sing to God. We have 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how wordy I am in the word. Oftentimes, never mind. We have a closing song that we sing, and this is what we all have to watch out for. We got to guard our hearts from this religious traditionalism where we come in, it's so easy for us to do, we come in, we go through this order of service, and you know, I'm not saying that our worship to God is not necessarily legitimate, but we disassociate it from the way that we live the rest of the week. This is not the heart of God for us. The heart of God is this, the order of service is good, the sacrifice is good, the praise is good, the Bible study is good, the living it out in our lives is even better when there's a sincerity and a genuineness that we bring to our Bible study where we say, not just for show, not just to be as loud as we can when we sing and our hands stretched up high so that everybody behind us can see our hands. <laughs> Lord, this is for you. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody here would do that, but... But you know, you know how we can be. Sometimes we don't even know the motivation of our own hearts. And so God is saying, listen, don't do this for show. Don't do this for self-justification. Do this because you love me. And guess how I'll know. Guess how I'll know. When you're walking in mercy. When you're walking in mercy. When you are filled with the knowledge of God, where there's a real genuine experience between you and me, because guess what? If there isn't all of that other stuff, it means nothing. And look, it's worse than nothing, because to whom much is given, much is required. There's going to be an expectation uh, that God has for you and for me as we're availing ourselves to him and to his word and the fellowship of his people, that the more we do that, the more we'll be growing. And if we're not growing, if we're not loving God, if we're not loving our neighbor as ourself more and more progressively, we need a heart check. We need to stop in our tracks and ask God to search our hearts. Jesus, he quoted this verse. This is why. He goes past Matthew by his tax collecting table. He's all, dude. Okay, he said, Matthew. He said, come and follow me. And Matthew's sitting there with a pile of cash. I mean, a pile of cash. He was a tax collector in Capernaum. You know, this was a major trade route. They had taxes on taxes. So he was a chief tax collector. This guy was wealthy. And he was ripping everybody off. So he's sitting there with a pile of cash. And you've got to picture this. Jesus is saying to him, hey, come and follow me. That's a rabbinical idiom. It means, not a rabbinical idiot. It's a rabbinical idiom. <laughs> which simply means this, be my disciple, come and live with me. You know, you're going to commit yourself completely to my lifestyle, to my teachings, you're leaving everything behind, and you are going to be my student 24-7. That's what that phrase meant. And there he is, he's like, cash, Jesus. <laughs> Lots of cash, poverty, no place to lay my head. And God was working so powerfully in this guy's life that this is what I think he thought. I think he thought, you know what? This isn't worth it. This isn't even. It doesn't even come close to following him. And he stands up. He leaves all of it behind, and he follows Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees, so Jesus goes. He hangs out with Matthew in his house. And the Pharisees are like, who is this guy who is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, all right, because they're like the lowest possible rung on the spiritual ladder. These Jews aren't even Jews. And so they say, who is this guy? If he was a prophet, he would know better. And Jesus says to them these words. He says, I desire, if you had known that I desire mercy and sacrifice. 
He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So church, listen. As we love God and as we're growing in God, and God is good to bring the uttermost and the guttermost to this place to save and restore and to heal, God help us to never look down our self-righteous noses and somehow think that we are better than other people because we hold to all of these traditions. If you and I are really loving God, you know what's going to happen? We're going to bear the heart of Christ, and our arms are going to be open wide. And when that person sits down next to us, whoever that person may be, we're not going to be all put out of place because they don't look right or smell right or because they're dressed a certain way. We're going to think, God, thank you for touching this person's heart, bringing them here to hear the message. God, I pray, save them tonight. That's got to be our heart. Look at and when, when that's our heart, you know what God's going to say? God's going to say, I can trust. I can trust that that ministry is going to do my work. And so he will send people here to be saved. Father, thank you so much. We love you, God, and we bless your name. We're so thankful for your word. And now every part, every portion, every word from your word speaks to our lives. And we just want to obey God, we want sincerity within us. God, we want to maintain the landmarks that you've established and we just confess to you, God, our brokenness and our absolute need for you. God, we're not ashamed tonight to humble ourselves and make that our confession. God, we need you. Without you, Lord, we can't do it. We can't overcome sin. We can't live lives of righteousness. We can't have hearts of mercy. Father, would you touch us tonight and speak to us and get your hands and your fingers into our lives. If there's anything that we've accommodated, God, any bitterness, any unforgiveness, any sin in our life that we've not really dealt with before you, God, we don't want to justify ourselves and cover that sin with layers of self-righteousness while it festers underneath, eating away. I pray, God, that you'd help us just to bear our hearts and, God, to come clean, to acknowledge our offense before you, to seek you, God, to pursue you earnestly with a seriousness. I pray, Holy Spirit, please move in this place and and you know what each of us needs to hear. And so we invite you to speak it. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as we're in an attitude of prayer, maybe this evening you've, you've never acknowledged to God. You've never confessed to Him. You've never taken responsibility for your sin. And maybe in your mind you've always thought, well, you know, Christianity is just a, a bunch of people who think they're good enough to make their way to God. You have this thought that What God wants is moral reform in your life. You just doing the right thing, being more moral, coming to church regularly. Listen, this is what God wants, and this is the gospel. He wants you to believe in the sacrifice of His Son. No amount of morality, no amount of personal goodness, no matter how many times you come to church, it's never enough to save you. It's never enough to provide for the forgiveness of your sins. No, your sins need to be forgiven, and the only way is through personal trust and faith and the sacrifice of His Son. This is how much God loves you. Not only did He make you, but God redeemed you. He bought you for Himself. He purchased you with the blood of His own Son. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He hung in your place. He took the wrath and the punishment that you deserve for your sin upon himself. He was a perfect lamb of God. He lived a righteous life for you on your behalf. 
He was dead and buried. He rose on the third day, and God affirmed the sufficiency of that sacrifice through the resurrection. Jesus is alive, and he is the way, he's the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Have you taken this step of faith? Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you acknowledged your sin before the Father, confessed and repented and received the Son as Savior and Lord? Tonight, if the answer to that is no, I want to give you an opportunity to make that answer yes. God is present in this place, and he's calling you to himself. He wants to heal you. He wants to bind up your wounds. He wants to restore your life. He wants you to experience the forgiveness of sins. He wants you to be his child. He wants you to leave this place tonight with the assurance of life everlasting and all that can be yours tonight if you believe in the gospel. Tonight, if God is speaking to your heart and, and you know tonight you need to make this step of faith, God has revealed to you your need for Jesus and you want to receive him tonight as your Savior and Lord, Tonight, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting, and I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand tonight. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want the Lord Jesus in my life. I want the forgiveness of my sins. I want life everlasting. Tonight, if this is you right where you're sitting, just stretch your hand up high tonight. I want to see who you are. I want to pray for you this evening. He loves you tonight. And before we close this service, if there's, if there's one of you this evening, you know you need to come to the Lord. Tonight is your night. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. You may have been putting this decision off and you know you're not even guaranteed tomorrow. Tonight you need to come. If there's one of you, just one of you tonight, you know God is speaking to your heart. Raise your hand. I want to see who you are. Tonight, if you need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ, you've been out in the world and you know that you need to come home to your Heavenly Father, I want you to raise your hand tonight as well. You need to recommit your life to the Lord. You need to be refreshed, renewed, revived spiritually tonight if this is you. Just one more moment. Just raise your hand tonight. I want to see who you are. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. Is there anybody else tonight? Look at, I just really sense that there's more than one person tonight. If God is speaking to you, just like God spoke to Matthew, you need to make a decision tonight to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anybody else here? I want you to raise your hand. Father, we love you so much, God. We are so grateful tonight for this life. And Father, all that you're doing in this life, we pray, God, please, that you would grant courage and strength now to take this step of faith. Lord, to be believing and to receive all that you have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen tonight for the one who has raised his hand, and maybe if there's other people here tonight, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. The word repent means just what I said earlier, that you confess your sin before God and you turn away from it. It's a prayer of trust and faith. Tonight you'll be believing in the sacrifice of Christ, his resurrection from the dead. And as you make this your prayer to God, he is going to heal and cleanse and restore your life. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. We talked about Matthew tonight, and just as Jesus called Matthew publicly tonight for this one, and maybe for anybody else here this evening, um, I want to call you publicly as well, not to embarrass you, but to give you the privilege tonight to identify yourself with Jesus Christ. It is a privilege and a blessing. And so listen, Tony is going to lead us in a song of worship. And tonight, for this one, listen, what I want you to do is as he leads us, just come on down to the front here. I want to lead you in prayer. But I want to say this. If there's anybody else, and you know who you are tonight, if God is speaking to you tonight, and you need to turn your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, either for the first time or to recommit your life to him, 
I want you to come down as well and receive the blessings that God has for you. So Tony's going to lead us. If this is you, stand up. Come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in this prayer. A refuge for the poor, a shelter from the storm. This is our God. He will wipe away your tears and return your wasted years. This is our God. So call upon His name. He is mighty to save. This is our God. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. Jesus, Lord and Savior. If there's anybody else tonight, God is speaking to your heart, and look at this is how you know your heart is beating, your hands are sweating, you know God has spoken to you, and tonight he's calling you to make a decision. God bless you, man. Praise God. Listen, if there's anybody else in this place tonight, God wants to bless your life. Don't allow the enemy, whatever he may say to you, all of these thoughts, well, what if I make this decision and this happens or that happens or people respond like this? None of that matters. All that matters is what God thinks. And tonight he has spoken to you and his desire for you is obedience. Let him pour forth the blessings of heaven in your life. If there's anybody else here tonight, we're not gonna just roll through this. This is the most important part of our service. And what God is doing in your life is important to us. More important than picking up our kids or going and watching football. Tonight, heaven, decisions for heaven are being made. God bless you. Praise God. Tony is going to lead us for one more moment. And as, as God is working on your heart, if this is you, just stand up. Make that decision tonight. Stand up. Stop arguing in your mind with God. Stand up and come forward and let him bless you. A father to the orphan and a healer to the broken. This is our God. He brings peace to my madness and comfort in my sadness. This is our God. To call upon his name, he is mighty to say, This is our God. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. Jesus, Lord. you guys in prayer tonight. So blessed at your obedience. God is going to reward you for it. He's going to bless you tonight. So as I lead you in prayer, this prayer is not to me. It's not to this church. We love you. But this prayer is to God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. And God himself is promised to hear and to answer. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so tonight, I want you to bow your heads with me. And I'd like you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. Tonight I confess I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me. That he rose on the third day. That through faith in him, You've forgiven me. You've made me your child. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you all my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. It's awesome.